the ability to put yourself in someone else's place has been at the forefront of social and political change at least since the 18th century. It's an ingredient in the stories of social and political change that we're often forgetting that's being left out of the history textbooks. I think you can look back through the last three or four hundred years of human history at least and see moments of mass empathic flowering which have shifted the political landscape. Take for example evacuation in the Second World War in Britain. One million children were sent from the cities to mostly rural and provincial homes to live with foster families. Relatively well-off rural people suddenly had the reality of urban poverty on their doorsteps. Poor kids from the streets of London and Liverpool and other cities, they saw them that they didn't have proper clothes or shoes, they had lice, they had rickets. And what happened? There was mass political change. There were questions raised in Parliament, women's organisations campaigning for child welfare policies as a result of this. And the government extraordinarily acted almost immediately at a time when there was huge resource scarcity due to the war. They expanded food and medical provision for children and all of this got solidified in the welfare state. Well, what really happened there was empathy occurring on a mass scale and changing society. Empathy is the imaginative capacity to put yourself in the shoes of another person and look at the world through their eyes. All human beings develop this by the age of about two or three, and they develop two different types of empathy. The first kind is what's called affective empathy, where you mirror or share somebody else's response. So if you see anguish on a child's face, and you too feel anguish, that's affective empathy. And the other kind of empathy is called cognitive empathy, or perspective-taking empathy. That's about where you're really trying to imagine, what is it like to be another person, to be a homeless guy sleeping out rough on a cold winter's night, for example. So I think there's this problem with too much focus on affective empathy, that emotional empathy, because yes, you see a photograph of uh, a child suffering you know, in the newspaper or on TV, and whether it's through affective empathy or guilt or sympathy, all sorts of emotions make us respond a lot to the individual. And of course, if we want to create a more moral world, we need to universalize our moral concern. That's what the cognitive empathy does, because it allows us to make that larger step away from just being so emotionally involved uh, in one individual to do something a little bit cooler. And it's about moving between the two of these. And we can move from the individual to the collective quite easily. And if you think of something like the film Schindler's List, Oscar Schindler and Nancy Sympathizer made friends with a Jewish accountant. But that one relationship and cognitive leap allowed him to start thinking about, well, what's it like and life like for all the workers in my factory? So empathy is ultimately about making an imaginative leap. And if you go back and read Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments, he says, well, what is it that human beings possess that is the basis for morality? It's our capacity, our imaginative capacity for changing places in fancy with a sufferer, as he put it, which I think is a wonderful phrase. You actually need to feel connected to another person or group of people and to be able to see their perspective so that you realize that they are something like you. But of course, there are limits to our imaginative capacities. Can I imagine what it's like to be a Rockefeller heiress or to be a shaman in the jungles of Ecuador? No, it's pretty difficult. But I can try. I can make an effort. And it's that ability or that desire to make an effort which can really make a difference. I think if you don't bring empathy into politics, what do you get? You get the Holocaust, you get things like the Nuremberg Laws, where you dehumanize people, whether it's Jews or Roma. You get things like right-wing populism rising in Europe today against immigrants and refugees, where you fail to see the other person as a human being. Empathy appeals to the individual because being able to see someone else's perspective allows us to function in our relationships, to get on with your kids or to get on with your partner. But when you can ramp empathy up to the collective level, that's when you can start shifting politics. And you don't get concern about human rights and social justice and so on without empathy being at the heart of it. The lesson of history is that empathy has opened the door of our moral concern and then rights and laws have come along and universalized that moral concern. They've opened that door more permanently.